As uh, as always, and as should be expected, these readings are, are perfect for <laughs> for what uh, we're going to be talking about today, even in more ways than maybe just relating to the transfiguration, which is a weird word that we never use. And so we're going to talk about uh, uh, what that means in a little bit. Uh, one of the uh, the things that I want to do uh, to today, well, no, I'm going to do this first. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so let's uh, real quick. If you have a Bible around you, uh, then there are someone put p- Bibles in the, most of the pews, which is really cool. Was that you? That was you. OK, excellent. Well, so, so there's Bibles everywhere. Otherwise, I'll have the words up here if you if you don't have one. And I'll explain why it was so awesome that Bibles appeared magically today and why it's so awesome that that these readings uh, fit in the way they do. So we're going to read the story of the transfiguration here as told in Matthew. And everyone's got a different translation in all of of the of the pews. And that's really good, too, because that's going to help us here for our uh, the rest of this message. So after six days, Jesus took with him Peter James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. Sounds familiar. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't let anyone, uh, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Word of God, word of life. All right, so this is where I was going. Uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday we'll start our regular Wednesday evening gatherings, and we'll have this booklet. It's kind of hard to see on the picture, but I'll have this booklet that we'll, that we'll hand out. And today for the message, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a preview of what those Wednesdays will be like. There'll be more interaction on a, on a Wednesday than there, there is today, and we're going to dig even deeper on Wednesdays than we will today, but I kind of wanted to, to let everyone get a taste of, of what we're going to be uh, talking about. So we're going to be talking about uh, the Bible today. One of the things that we're going to be discussing on Wednesdays and that we'll touch on right now is that the Bible is meant to be meditation literature. And what does that mean? It means that it's meant to be read over and over and over again, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And, then again. and, and you're supposed to uh, read it, and, and uh, you'll notice things that seem odd to you as you're reading it. And those are the things that you're then supposed to go talk to people about. So I was reading in my Bible about uh, Moses sprinkling blood all over people. That's gross, right? It's gross. You can say it. It's fine. That's weird. We don't sprinkle blood on people generally. Uh, What's going on here? Those are the things that, that you meditate on. What's happening here? Find someone. Discuss them. Look it up. Find me. You were meant to be reading this over and over and over again. It, it seems like an insurmountable task oftentimes to, to read the entire Bible, and, and most people uh, don't do it. But really, uh, here's some math, and I'll kind of read it because it's kind of small. But there are uh, basically 1,200 chapters in the Bible. And if you were, were to read five chapters a day, it's about 10 minutes. A chapter is basically a page. And so if you read five chapters per day, about 10 minutes, you could read the whole Bible in less than a year. It, so it's, it's a kind of a small uh, amount of time that you dedicate per day. Uh, but you, as with anything, uh, over time, you'll have accomplished something big. And so then in five years, you'll have read the Bible 
eight times if you dedicate uh, just 10 minutes, 10 minutes every day. And by doing this, you get to start seeing things in the Bible that you don't necessarily see when you just read it one sentence at a time or only hear sort of these things on Sunday mornings. You start to see different things. And so in the interest of reading our Bibles uh, over and over and often again, we're going to talk about Moses on the mountain. So we saw a story of Moses going up to the mountain, sprinkling blood on people, gross, and then going up to the mountain and, and meeting with God there. We saw that in Exodus 24 for our reading. We're going to go to another story of Moses on a mountain. It happens quite a bit in, in the book of Exodus. And so we're going to turn to Exodus 34. So if you've got a Bible and you want to pull it out, that'd be awesome. Uh, there's also apps that you can use. Exodus is the second book. There's Genesis, Exodus. So you can just go to the beginning, to Genesis, and then keep going forward until you find Exodus. Those are probably the two easiest uh, to find. So we're going to go to Exodus 34. I cheated and marked mine ahead of time. But, <laughs> but if you can find Exodus 34, it's the second book. Chapter 34, the chapters are the big numbers, and then the verse is the little number, big number 34 and little number 29. Some of your Bibles may even have a little heading in it. Mine says, the radiant face of Moses. Some of them others may say other things. But we're going to start here in, chapter, in uh, verse 29 and just read to 32. And so here's another story of, of Moses on the mountain. When Moses, so Moses has been up to the mountain. When Moses came down from the Mount, from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was, saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the elders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. Now, here's a story of Moses going up to a mountain, talking to God. Uh, something happens to him. Uh, people are afraid, and he comes back down the mountain to meet with the people. So here's the story. Moses goes up. We read about him going up after he sprinkles the blood. God is physically present. Present, uh, We read, we heard in our reading that there is a bright cloud there. God's presence is a, a cloud and fire. It's, it's these, these images that the people at the foot of the mountain we often hear are afraid of. There's something so uh, gigantic and, 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 and crazy going up at the top of the mountain. We're going to stay here. Moses, you go up there. There's no way we're going up there. And so Moses goes up. That's his job is to go up to the mountain. So God is physically present and God speaks with Moses there on the mountain. Many times in the book of Exodus, this happens. In this story in particular, Moses is transformed. So if you have a uh, uh, NLT. Is anyone right now looking at an NLT? It says, well, we'll get to that. It doesn't say anything about Moses being transformed, does it? Okay. Darn it. We're going to get there <laughs> soon, soon. So Moses is transformed uh, physically on this mountain. Sound familiar? It should. Because we just read about the same thing happening to Jesus. And so that takes us then to this idea of repeated patterns in the Bible. Every time you read the Bible, the entire Bible, uh, you notice these stories of happening over and over again. And isn't that a bit like life? Right? Where you just you can continue to find yourself in these same situations, and maybe you don't find yourself in that situation, but you see your kids in that same situation. Or you see people you're mentoring going through the same struggles that you went through, and you think to yourself, if only you would listen to me. <laughs> they won't. And so they go through the story. And then they find themselves in a position to be saying to someone else, if only you, you would listen to me. And they won't. And so repeated patterns are something that we deal with in our whole lives. And that's why there's such an important part of the Bible, and that's why you read it over and over again. So we just heard a story of Moses going up to the mountain and being transformed. We're now going to hear about someone else going up to a mountain. 
we're going to see another uh, repetition in this pattern. We're going to turn to first Kings. Oh, good Lord. How are we ever going to find first Kings? The, <laughs> the best way is to go to the table of contents. There's a table of contents at the beginning of the Bible. Look for one Kings and you can, and you can find it there. I have marked mine ahead of time because I am a cheater. So you can find uh, First Kings. It comes uh, right after Second Samuel, which comes right after First Samuel, which you know this sort of thing. So, <laughs> so we're looking for First Kings and to, chap- to chapter nineteen. First Kings, big number nineteen, and we're going to start uh, with with verse eight is what I have. <clears throat> written here. And so you may notice if we read from verse 8 to 13 where we go that in some of your Bibles we're going to cross one of these big headings. It's like we're reading the end of one story and the beginning of another story. Does anyone see that in the Bible that that they have where we're we're mixing two stories? These headings people put in there. You know, you can ignore them. It's okay. So so, uh, we're going to start here at verse 8 and we're going to hear a somewhat familiar story. So Elijah has been starving and Elijah now has been fed and is regaining his strength. So he got up and ate and drank strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here? Elijah He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And we won't continue reading, but then we go on to hear uh, God speaking to Elijah here. So we have a lot of the same 40 days. He's up there for 40 days. And Moses, we heard 40 days and Moses and Elijah covers his face. Moses covers his face after it's shining. There's some similarities here in these stories. Elijah goes to the mountain. Elijah goes to the mountain uh, where where God is physically present. And here's where our NLT friends can help us. Because if you have an NLT, it probably says not Mount Horeb. It says what? Mount Sinai, which is the exact same mountain that Moses was on. It's the same mountain, just a different name. And so, so sometimes when you're reading Bibles, depending on the tr- translation, the translators will do some of that work for you. And here in the NLT, the translators have said, well, it's important that people understand that Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. So we're just going to come right out and tell them. We're going to change it to say Port, uh, Sinai because that's more important than them understanding that it was called Horeb. They do some of that, some of that background work for you. Other translations may have a little note next to Mount Horeb, and down at the bottom it says this is another name for Mount Sinai. So Bible translators, depending on their philosophy, will do some of this work. So Elijah goes up to the mountain, to Mount Sinai, the same mountain where Moses met with God. God is physically present there in a still small voice, and God speaks to Elijah. And if we were to read on, we would hear about Elijah being commissioned where God uh, calls Elijah to go down the mountain and gives him orders. This is another part of the Bible, if you continue to read, where you might be confused and want to talk to someone because God gives Elijah orders uh, of conquest and battle, and sometimes those are hard for us to read. So this would be a perfect opportunity, again, 
to speak to someone and try to understand exactly why a God is telling Elijah to overtake a land and all the brutality that, that, that involves. Again, uh, we're scratching the surface here. So we're just only focusing on, on sort of one aspect of these stories. And that's why I say that this is so deep and never ending that we'll never fully understand this. So another thing about the Bible is that it all points to Jesus. Scripture finds its culmination in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If you read in the Gospel of Luke, I have it written here, that after Jesus is resurrected, he meets with people on the road. And it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all of the Scriptures concerning himself. So somehow, we're to read these stories of Moses and Elijah, and we're supposed to understand that somehow this is pointing to Jesus. And this is sort of another layer of the complexity of, of biblical study. And so if you're someone that, that loves uh, to read it at a surface level and it's meaningful to you, that's great. If you're someone that loves to dig deeper and is, loves to kind of continually learn, then you have an infinite resource here that you can learn about. And so God is, is uh, beautiful in that way also. So we've heard about Moses on the mountain. We've heard about Elijah on the mountain. And because Scripture finds its fulfillment in Jesus, we're going to hear about Jesus on the mountain. We already read through it uh, together, but we're going we're gonna to read through it together here and, and focus on a couple of key things. So it starts out after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So we read this, and we're supposed to remember Moses being transfigured. We're supposed to remember Elijah going up to the mountain to meet with the Lord. If we're uh, responsible Bible readers and we're reading the Bible again and again and again, when we get to this portion, we'll have all this background that we can pull from. So we're supposed to remember Moses and Elijah. And this is another place where our NLT translators help us out because most of our translations here probably say transfigured. Right. So if you're re looking at a translation, it'll say transfigured, except the NLT says something else. Do you have it pulled up there? What the NLT says? I know what it says. If you don't transformed, that's a word we know. So, so they've kind of helped us out again. The, the translators have, have helped us out by using a word that we understand transformed there. He was transformed before them. Most translations use the word transfigured because it has a history in the church. This is uh, the, uh, the remembrance of the Lord's transfiguration on this day. And so the, the word has become important throughout church history. And so that's why it's in most of the translations. It's transformed. He changed. He went up. Something happened. And he looks different now. He's transformed. Did any of you have transformers? The, yeah, right. And they transform. He, Jesus didn't turn into a car, but he, you know, he changed. He changed here. Something happened to Jesus. So we read about Jesus going to the mountain. We're supposed to remember Moses and Elijah. So Jesus goes up to the top of the mountain. Let's continue reading. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah. Hey, what do you know? Who would have guessed that we would find Moses and Elijah at the top of a mountain? And they were talking with Jesus this time. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And if you're thinking to yourself, what are you talking about, Peter? That's the correct response. Because if you read the story in the Gospel of Mark, Mark adds right after this in a little parenthetical to the reader. He says, Peter didn't know what he was talking about. He's scared out of his mind. He's seeing Moses and Elijah and he's freaking out. 
We would all be in that same situation where you go up there with your friend and teacher and he transforms in front of you. And then there's Moses. And then there's Elijah. You freak out. Peter's freaking out here. So it's interesting. While he was still speaking, he being Peter, a bright cloud covered them. Basically, God is saying, Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm coming here. Forget about your shelters. So we read that Jesus goes up to the mountain and God is physically present in the cloud. And a voice from the cloud says, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. So here we read that after Jesus goes to the mountain and that God's physical presence is there in a frightening way, God speaks God speaks to the people at the top of the mountain. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. How would you not be afraid? People are appearing and disappearing. It's weird. Uh, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anybody what you've seen. Until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. What? I mean, put yourself in the mind of, of Peter and John. What are you talking about? This is a mind blowing experience uh, for these people. That's why they, they're saying confusing things. But Jesus goes to the mountain. God is physically present. God speaks. Jesus is transformed in the same way that Moses was transformed. But Jesus was also commissioned in the same way that Elijah was commissioned. Because this is the moment where Jesus' Jesus' glory is revealed to his disciples. This is the moment where Jesus comes down the mountain and starts heading for Jerusalem. This is the moment where we start heading in to the season of Lent. Right now, Jesus has been transformed and commissioned. And so if we're going to be reading our Bibles wisely, we learn a few things about the Bible in particular here in in these three stories. What do we learn? The Bible is meant to be a lifelong companion. It's, It's not meant to be read once at most. Okay, I got that. I understand it. I know everything there is to know. The beauty of it is you will never know all there is to know. It's, it's impossible. So it's meant to be a, life, a lifelong companion that we read continually over and over, day after day. It's meant to be discussed in community when we read about Moses sprinkling blood and God commanding armies to go uh, attack other nations. When we read about Jesus doing miraculous things to bring healing in people's lives, and we look around and we don't see miracles. That's to stir something in us. It, just, it needs to agitate us. If you've ever seen how a pearl is, is made, a real pearl, it's dust or agitation that gets inside this clamshell and the clam through a process of trying to protect itself from this foreign body that's invaded its clamshell home. It creates this layer of protection that we then harvest and string on a necklace. But but this is how pearls are made. This is how wisdom is gained by saying, I don't like how this feels, and so I'm going to push into it even harder rather than retreating. I'm going to do my best to understand this, what this means for me. And so part of the way we do this is by discussing this in community to let other people speak into our lives, learn from other people's experiences. And the Bible uh, is more beautiful and deep than we can comprehend. Uh, I pointed out a couple similarities between these three stories, and I'm telling you there are many more. I had on the cutting room floor of this sermon preparation were so many things that I wanted to share with you, but we would be here all Sunday long. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. It, if you don't believe me, 
Put the three stories next to each other and read through them. It's, it's unbelievable. And not only do that, but read what happens right before each story to each person. Read what happens right after the story to each person. The parallels are unbelievable. The, beautiful, uh, the beauty of the compilation of these stories, of these writings, of the Holy Spirit, as Peter said in his, uh, in his letter, the Holy Spirit has inspired these writings. And if you don't believe it, all you have to do is start studying it. And you'll see that this is so deep and so beautiful and so meaningful and so true that there's no other explanation for how this thing, first of all, came to be 2,000 years ago, and then is still here in our hands, uh, sitting, laying around here. There's so many Bibles and translations that we can't even keep track of them all. It's a blessing to have these things. And it's a blessing that we get to experience this Bible together as a community. So that's what we learn about the Bible. And so to go from teaching to preaching, then we must talk about what do we, uh, what does this tell us about Jesus then? Because we've seen what happens to Moses a little bit. We've seen what happens to Elijah. Now we saw how this pattern was repeated in the life of Jesus. And by comparing and contrasting these accounts of these events, we can begin to understand some more about Jesus. So Jesus, first of all, is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. One, another way of saying the law and the prophets is the law is the writings in your Bible of Moses. This is the way that Jesus and his disciples would have understand. The law and the prophets are Moses and Elijah. And Jesus goes to the top of the mountain, and Moses and Elijah are there. The disciples look away, and when they look back, it's just Jesus. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of this law that we receive on the mountain from Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies that we read about, and that prophets like Elijah and Jonah and Ezekiel and Daniel, and Malachi, there's lots of them in there. <laughs> these, uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of what uh, all of these writings have been pointing to. Another thing we learn about Jesus is that Jesus was there for it all. As Jesus went up to the top of the mountain, mountain, and I have written here, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And so if we go back to those stories of Moses going up to the mountain and he's meeting with the presence and a radiant presence that is so radiant that he himself begins to radiate. He himself is transformed. Then we start to think to ourselves, were they talking to Jesus? Was Moses up when he's talking to God? He's talking to, to Jesus. When Elijah is talking to God, he's, he's talking to Jesus. And Jesus was there for it all because Jesus is God. And the story helps uh, remind us that Jesus was there at the top of the mountain. Jesus was there at creation. Jesus is God. And you say, how can Jesus be there for that and be here? And that's a, another time when I say, this is why we read it in community. This is another thing that you push into. This is another one of those mysteries that you say, wow, this is, I'm never, this is amazing. What's going on here? These are the things that I love. So Jesus was, was there for it all. And so if Jesus was there for it all, and Moses goes up to the mountain to speak with Jesus, and he is transformed. And Elijah goes up to the top of the mountain, and he is commissioned then what we can learn about going to the top of the mountain to meet with the Lord is that if you seek God, you will be transformed. You will be transformed if you actively seek God. It's not to say that God is not with you. Always. That's a promise we have. But there's something special about saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek God first then. 
I'm going to be greedy for the presence of God, so much so that I'm not content with him just being around. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to see where God is in all of these situations. I'm going to make it my priority to understand that God is here. And all of these things, as we read that when uh, the disciples saw this, they were afraid. And they, they're huddling in the corner on the ground. Like, what is going on here? They don't even want to look because they're going to die if they see the glory of God. They can't even begin to understand what is, is happening here. And so they're afraid and they're shaking and they've kind of shut down. And Jesus touches them. Isn't that interesting? It's not just a voice uh, from the cloud. But the beauty of having Jesus uh, uh, as God with us is that Jesus touches them. They are transformed. Their fear is taken away. And so we can say, when we're in these moments where we're lost and we're huddled and we're scared, we say, God, I thought I knew what I was supposed to be doing. And God, why? I'm trying to follow you and I'm trying to uh, look after you every day and I'm trying to read my stupid Bible and it's confusing. What's going on here? And God, I don't understand why my family's fighting all the time. And God, I don't understand uh, why my uh, parents don't uh, treat me the way that I think they should. And God, I don't understand why my job isn't going the way I think it should. God, I don't understand why I don't have these things. God, I don't understand why I live faithfully and my life still isn't what I think it should be. God, I'm scared. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. And you seem so far away. You're just a voice. You seem so far away and Jesus touches you. And so this is an opportunity and a reminder to go after God and allow Jesus to touch you. One of the ways that we do this, one of the ways that we encounter God, one of the ways that we uh, get beyond our inability to see God with our eyes and hear God with our ears and feel God with our skin is through prayer. This is how we interact with things that are uninteractable. This is how we uh, make real the things that sometimes to us don't feel real because we don't interact with them the same way we interact with wood and leather. And so I want to invite you now uh, to pray with me. And we're going to pray for God uh, to make himself known. We're going to pray uh, for Jesus to come and touch every one of us. And if you're someone that needs to feel the touch of Jesus in your life, then you're going to pray for that right now. And if you're someone that needs the encouragement to continue to read your Bible, then we're going to pray for that right now. And if you're someone that needs more understanding, we're going to pray for that. And if we're someone that needs to just be able to let it go and say, I, I'm never going to understand. I don't quite get what's going on. God, I need you to take this from me. Then that's what we're going to pray for. Uh, so will you pray with me now? Lord God, Heavenly Father, Moses met you on that mountain. Elijah met you on the mountain. Jesus, we know that you are on the mountain, and so we approach you now. We come to the mountain expecting to encounter you, expecting to see you, expecting to hear you, expecting to feel your touch in areas of our lives where we need your healing touch, Jesus. So right now, we ask you, individually and as a group, to touch our lives, to touch those areas of our lives that need the Holy Spirit, to touch those areas of our lives that need redeeming, to touch those areas of our lives that need resurrection. So I want to give everyone now a few seconds silently to pray to the Lord, to ask specifically for Jesus' touch in your life. If you'll do that now. Lord, we thank you. 
We thank you that you have made your presence known in the past over and over and over again. And so we thank you that we can come expectantly, that you will make your presence known to us. Sometimes in a storm, Lord, and sometimes in a whisper. And so, Lord, you know what each and every one of us needs. And so we ask that your presence be known to us in the way that each and every one of us needs. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for an opportunity here to gather and and study the Bible, Lord, and to contend with the things that make us uncomfortable and to rejoice over the things that make us happy. Lord, we offer our lives to you as a sacrifice. We love you and we thank you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, who was transformed in that mountain, that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Amen.